Welcome to the Funky Diabetic Podcast with your host, Kate E. Taffy. The purpose of this podcast is to share the struggles, achievements, insights, and opinions of diabetics and their loved ones. These episodes will feature stories that will inspire, dissuade, entertain, and educate. My hope is that each episode will leave you with some degree of comfort, camaraderie, or empathy, whether or not diabetes has touched your life in any way thus far. You should know that none of the statements made within this podcast should be construed as medical or legal advice in any way. Any changes made to your diet or diabetes management should be made only after consulting with a medical professional. Now, without further ado, please enjoy the Funky Diabetic Podcast. Hey everyone, as you just heard, my name is Kate Etassi, and welcome to my brand new podcast, The Funky Diabetic Podcast, and today's mini episode. In this episode, I'm just going to explain a bit about why I created the podcast and what I see for future episodes, and I'm also going to share my experience about contracting COVID-19 in late March and explain why the virus can be a lot more dangerous to a diabetic's health than for others. Now, for anyone wondering why I chose to spell the funky in funky diabetic with a PH, there were actually a few reasons behind that. The first and most important is that it honors the legendary Fife Dog from the iconic hip-hop group, A Tribe Called Quest. He spelled his stage name with a PH and is notorious for spinning the line, when's the last time you heard a funky diabetic? Hearing that verse in the song, Oh My God, was the first time I had ever heard any singer or MC mentioning my disease. I know Fife Dog, since that song, has said that he had no intention of becoming a poster child for diabetes, and was just rhyming when he wrote the lyric, but hearing it at the time made me feel special, as if being diabetic was suddenly cool. Yeah, I knew that my idol, B.B. King, had it. I knew that Mary Tyler Moore had it. Uh, but there was just something different about a rapper having it. Not only that, but to to put it in your rhymes and to add it in a verse about who you are and who your group is, and within that description, identify yourself as a funky diabetic. I claimed that line for myself as soon as I heard it. I was hooked. Sadly, Fife Dog, whose real name was Malik Isaac Taylor, struggled a lot with his diabetes, and he ended up going into renal failure, I think a few times before his death. Uh, They had an amazing documentary about a tribe called Quest, and in it, he explained that he was just addicted to sugar. Uh, I read that he did try and lose some weight and eat right before he received a kidney transplant from his wife in 2008, But unfortunately, a few years after that, he ended up going back on dialysis and the transplant list. Uh, Unfortunately, Fife died in 2016 uh, at just the young age of 45, and it was reported that it was due to complications from his diabetes. Anyone who knows me knows that I am a huge hip-hop head and a huge fan of A Tribe Called Quest. To me, Fife will always represent not only one of my all-time favorite MCs, but also a diabetic who publicly admitted the challenges he faced with food and with taking proper care of his disease. He was an uber-talented and highly successful person, but he also mistreated himself and eventually paid the ultimate sacrifice. There's a lot there that I identify with, and I think once you listen to more episodes, you'll understand a bit more about why I'm saying that. By calling this the Funky Diabetic Podcast, I seek to honor the imperfect yet authentic and admirable person that Fife Dog was. Now, the second reason behind the PH is a semi-lighthearted reference to the fact that a type 1 diabetic's pH levels in their interstitial fluids and blood are one of the very many things that are different for diabetics. For anyone aware, excuse me, for anyone unaware, uh, this disease can affect almost any and every part of your body, and when it does, it's pretty relentless. And that's why I think it's so important to uh, take the time that I have now as a disabled person to try and inform and educate and commiserate and explain to others why it's so important to take care of yourself, Uh, you know, in general, but also especially if you're a diabetic and you need to be trying to at least receive the proper medical care for it. 
And the last reason is because someone actually goes by the name of Funky Diabetic, spelt with an F, on SoundCloud, and I believe they're doing some sort of uh, sports podcast. So I thought I should probably change my name up a bit. I mean, let's be real. What's funkier than funk with a PH? Anyway, as for diabetic podcasts, I know there are some great ones out there, and I have had the honor of being on Diabetic Tim's podcast before. We had a great conversation. Uh, I'm not trying to take away from anyone else's, copy anyone else, or step on anyone else's toes by doing this podcast. I just wanted to establish a forum where uh, my listeners can learn about, commiserate with, and help support diabetics as they navigate through their incurable disease uh, as individuals, but also as a community. So in the podcast, we're going to cover a lot of different topics that affect not only diabetics, but their loved ones as well. And they're going to include things from diets to eating disorders, what a, a significant other might need to know about when a diabetic is going low or high, uh, exercise and participating in sports, dating and sex, access to health care, diabetic-related complications, what diabetes teaches you about your life, what you believe it actually takes you away from, and what you're able to achieve in spite of it, or maybe because of it, and so much more. So I plan for these episodes to be as informative and encouraging as possible, but I'm also not planning to sugarcoat anything or hide the bad bits under the rug. The main reason for that is I want to try and eradicate any kind of shame uh, that surrounds this issue because diabetes management is a rather difficult thing to do. Sometimes it can feel impossible. Sometimes it can be incredibly frustrating and, and exhausting. And I want to try and shed light on some of the harder topics so that people will understand that uh, not only the fact that you cannot be a perfect patient 100% of the time, but also that we're all human. We all have setbacks, we all have failures, we have limitations and points of exhaustion. And what's really important is to know that we can lean on each other, that we're not the only one that's maybe messing up, uh, we're not the only one who's struggling, and we're not Instagram perfect, filtered all the time. Uh, we're humans, and we need to be able to do a little bit of a better job to acknowledge the good as well as the bad. So that's what I plan for the kind of mood of the podcast. And I'm not trying to make it a, a, a pretty negative thing about diabetes. This disease is mostly manageable, but it can also be debilitating and uh, frustrating. And when there are problems, sometimes the disease can seem really relentless. And to take that note and make a small plug for my upcoming memoir, uh, it's entitled Relentless, From National Champion to Physically Disabled Activist. I used to be a track athlete back in a former lifetime. I also used to be a criminal defense attorney and civil rights activist. And this book covers my 32 years as a type 1 diabetic and a patient of recurring tethered spinal cord, chronic pain patient, and now a disabled person. And it talks about all the lessons that the health complications have taught me and all that I've been through, mostly in spite of them, but sometimes because of them. And I think it's really important to highlight the diabetes because it's not something that automatically is going to keep you out of the game uh, but you do need to make sure that you pay it special mind that you're putting it as a top priority because uh, otherwise it will take you out of the game. So in these episodes, I'm going to go into a multitude of complications that I've suffered as a result of my diabetes. I also do that in the book. And part of the reason that I've endured over 50 surgeries and medical procedures since 1988 is because of how long I've had the brittle type 1 diabetes, but it's also because I neglected it for over 10 years. And I own up to it in the book, and I will in the podcast, and I want it to be a cautionary tale 
for other diabetics to treat themselves with a little bit more grace and self-care. When it got tough for me or when obstacles were put in my way with the diabetes, I just ignored it. And that is not an option if you want to have a healthy life. So I'm hoping that for any diabetic or loved one of a diabetic who listens to this or reads the book, that uh, they will pass along that information or absorb that information and act accordingly. And hopefully those diabetics, as well as all future diabetics, will not have to endure the extent of diabetic-related complications that I have. Now, perhaps the biggest upshot right now for taking better care of yourself and your diabetes is that according to the American Diabetes Association, if your diabetes is under control when you contract COVID, you're actually at a lower risk of suffering from severe complications or dying from it than uh, diabetics who don't have it as well maintained. On the flip side, if your diabetes is unstable, or you're also suffering from heart disease or other diabetes-related complications, you're at a greater risk of serious COVID-19 complications, uh, simply because your body's immune system is going to be less able to fight off the virus. And it's also important to point out that whenever a diabetic is facing any kind of illness or virus, they're at a higher risk of developing diabetic ketoacidosis, which is called DKA, uh, and that itself can put you into a coma and or kill you. Uh, I went into a bout of it in 2009, and it was because of a simple gastrointestinal uh, uh, problem, just a simple virus, and I was in the hospital for over a week. So I would recommend checking out the ADA's website for more information about what they know as of this moment about how it's impacting patients with diabetes. Uh, their website is diabetes.org, and you can check out their up-to-date information about what to do, if you think you have it, what to look out for, what to bring to the hospital if you think you have to go, and uh, anything they have learned about how the virus is uh, differently impacting diabetics. I unfortunately contracted coronavirus in late March, but thankfully it seems to have been a rather mild case of it, and I'm mostly recovered at this point. Um, I will say that two days ago, I spent most of the day with intense diarrhea and was vomiting, and it was going to be pretty close to me going back to the hospital um, had it not stopped or had I not been able to keep food down. And I want to point out, for especially for diabetics, I developed my first symptoms on Sunday morning, March 29th, and I was at the hospital by 5 p.m. because my symptoms were developing at a pretty rapid pace and they were worsening. And it was, it was scary. Uh, I woke up that morning with a throbbing headache, body aches, kind of body uh, chills, a sore throat, and a cough, and the feeling that my chest was burning every time I inhaled. But I wasn't getting too nervous when I first woke up. I did dry heave, but I didn't throw anything up. And then by noon, I had a low-grade fever. So that's when I checked out the COVID-19 online risk assessment tool. And since I was in a high-risk population as a type 1 diabetic and I had a fever, it suggested that I call a nurse hotline. Unfortunately, the nurse I spoke with told me that since I was able to breathe enough to speak with her on the phone, my breathing issues clearly weren't that bad. Uh, she let me know that from what she'd heard, they were turning everyone away from the ER who wasn't in a life-threatening condition at that very moment. And I asked her, why does the risk assessment tool identify high-risk populations and warn them to give the hotline a, a call if you're not going to treat them any differently than someone who's not in the high-risk population? She kind of glossed over that and then suggested that I wait to see if maybe I wake up during the middle of the night and I can't catch my breath. And at that point, I was actually kind of triggered 
And I let her know that a dear friend of mine had died in that exact same way just a month prior. She woke up gasping for breath and was laying next to her young daughter and the EMTs couldn't resuscitate her. So I was pretty rude (laughs) to the nurse at this time and I do apologize and regret that tone that I took, but I found it kind of offensive that her medical advice to me was to wait until I'm close to death before calling an ambulance or somehow making my way to an ER. She did try and reassure me that her advice wasn't to wait until you're close to death's door, but I was not convinced. Uh, She was kind of blowing me off because I could still breathe, and so she told me to just contact my primary care. Um, Now, I want to say I'm I was not oblivious to the fact that hospitals and clinics were being inundated with people scared of contracting coronavirus. I was sensitive to the fact that medical facilities were overworked, understaffed, and dealing with very limited resources and very sick patients. I knew that there were drive-through testing centers available, uh, but that I would have to wait until Monday to ask my doctor for a prescription for it. Um... I was concerned at this point, but decided to just hang up, not uh, further berate the nurse, and see how my symptoms progressed through the rest of Sunday. Um, I knew that my body was uh, very kind of immune compromised at this point in my life, and that I tend to develop viruses very, very quickly. So I just tried to stay calm, tried to wait it out until the morning, and uh, tried to rest up for a bit. But unfortunately, within a matter of hours, I was feeling worse, and my fever went over 100. So I called my diabetic specialist's office, and thankfully the Jocelyn Diabetes Center has an on-call doctor. Uh, and She got back to me within minutes of my call. She let me know that I needed to go to the ER, and I'm so thankful that I called her and had that reassurance, because by the time I entered the ER, uh, I did have a temp of 101, a heart rate of 140 beats per minute, elevated blood pressure, and my blood sugar was over 300. They did a lot of tests, and I did have low levels of magnesium. They gave me fluids. I also had a low number of a certain type of white blood cell that they were finding occurred in positive COVID-19 patients. So they believed at that point that I probably had it. I thankfully did not have any pneumonia at that point. So they were discharging me and telling me to self-quarantine along with evens for the next 14 days, do not go out not even for groceries or prescriptions, have everything delivered to your door and left on the porch, um, and that it would unfortunately be probably at least six to eight days before they got the test results back because of the backlog at the labs. Um, And I want to say that the ER department at Henry Henry Ford Hospital was fantastic. Uh, They did not hesitate bringing me in for treatment and testing, The entire staff, though clearly exhausted, was nothing but thorough, professional, and compassionate. And they knew how serious this was for me, and they treated me with a lot of kindness, even though I could tell that it was the last place that they probably wanted to be. Um, So while I was sent home, I was given some medication to try and keep my fever down, I was told to hydrate and to come back to a hospital for inpatient uh, treatment if my fever couldn't stay down, if I started uh, being unable to breathe, and otherwise I was to stay my butt home. So they actually were hoping that I didn't have to come back to the hospital because they've seen patients get a lot sicker just by sticking around and picking up the germs of another patient. The next day, Monday, uh, was rough. It was really rough. I had severe chills. I was sweating through my clothes. 
I was incredibly uncomfortable. I didn't want to eat or drink. I wanted to sleep, but I couldn't sleep. And then I kept nodding off. Um, it took me hours before I even had the strength or the uh, desire to pick up my cell phone. And it was unfortunately my dad's birthday. So I did send him a text later in the day. Um, but it was the first time I could manage the, the desire or the will or the ability to even pick up my phone. Uh, my blood sugar was not coming down, and I did have trouble staying hydrated, especially because I didn't want to drink anything. The following morning, a nurse called to say that they had actually already gotten my test results back. We were both pretty shocked by that. Um, and unfortunately, I did test positive. She gave me some further instructions on what to do and gave me a hotline that was dedicated just for patients that were positive for COVID-19 and uh, let me know to continue to stay quarantined for those 14 days. So once I was able to get the fever down, the virus was a lot more manageable. I was able to avoid going into diabetic ketoacidosis, although my blood sugar did stay up for a while. It did hurt to breathe for at least a week, week and a half, but I seem to have gotten through most of this virus without any kind of lung damage, which I'm really grateful for. Um, every few days, I'll have a bad day, but nothing too alarming, uh, except for the vomiting and diarrhea a couple days ago. Um, another way for a diabetic to score a hospital bed with this kind of virus or any kind of virus is to have uncontrolled vomiting. If you can't keep any food or juice down, then you're going to need to get yourself some IV sugar so that your blood sugar doesn't go too low. Too low, you go into a coma, you die. Too high, you develop DKA, you go into a coma, you die. So pretty high stakes, whether you're sick or not, uh, but it's a lot more difficult to take care of yourself and make sure you're eating or getting the sufficient amount of insulin if you feel like hell. That being said, I, once again, am mostly through it. I do think it's going to take a while before it's completely out of me. My immune system is fairly messed up. Uh, so it's going to be a while, but I am grateful that I seem to be past the worst of it and that it didn't get all that bad for me personally. Um, I don't know what would have happened if I had waited longer as that first nurse suggested. Um, all I know is that I'm glad that I trusted my gut and called Jocelyn and got someone's opinion who actually knows diabetes and knows how serious this can really get for us. Um, I know that there's a lot that we as a human species still don't know about this virus. Uh, we also don't really fully understand its impact on certain segments of the population but I uh, am really thankful for the medical advances that we've had uh, thus far, that we live in a time where we can have uh, virtual visits with our doctors, and even mental health-wise, that we have um, video calling, we have Zoom, we have the ability to text and email and call and voice call with our uh you know, Facebook app and WhatsApp and Skype and FaceTime and there's social media and there's streaming services. And so there's a lot of ways for us to stay entertained while we're all self-quarantining and socially distancing ourselves from one another. But it can still feel pretty lonely and it can feel pretty scary if you're a diabetic and you don't know if... Um, Maybe pharmacies are going to close or you won't be able to get your supplies because there's a backlog. Um, so if you can take any comfort from hearing about my story, I would hope that you understand that COVID-19 is not an automatic death sentence, not even for someone who's immune compromised as I am. Um, I've had almost every diabetic-related complication there is, and I was still able to get through it. But I acted quickly. 
I listened to medical professionals. I took the self-quarantining seriously. I did um, warm salt water mouth gargles, uh, which my husband and his cousin came up with a special Haitian recipe for, which was pretty nasty, but it seems to have done the, the trick. So we really just need to kind of buckle down and do what's best for our health at this time, because I don't know that I've seen a time where every major city is, it looks like a ghost town. And this is all because of a medical issue. So it is a scary time. I recognize that, um, especially for those in a high-risk population. But there are resources, and there's information out there. There's not always accurate information out there, and there's fake news going on. But trust the known, trusted, vetted sources. Trust your support system. Trust your medical professionals. And try your best to stay calm if you think you have been exposed to it. For diabetics, you know, I should say, and I should have said uh, before I got into COVID uh, discussions that I am not a medical professional, and even though I'm a lawyer, I am not um, giving any kind of medical or legal advice. But what I can do is just share my personal experience with you, let you know what worked for me, and um, let you know that I am here as a resource if anyone uh, wants to share their concerns or questions with me. And I can let you know that what worked to get me through it was eating healthy, doing the warm salt water mouth gargles, keeping an eye on my temperature, blood sugar, and ketone levels, staying hydrated, and if you do get to the point where you have a fever that's not coming down, you're vomiting, you have trouble breathing or develop ketones, obviously consult your either diabetic specialist or your primary care physician or a hotline, contact a medical professional and find out what you should do. Uh, so I know that this is scary. I am scared. This is a very new normal that we're going to have to get used to even after we come out of hiding. But we can rely on one another. And I hope that while we're hiding in our little caves, that everyone is trying to do their best to treat their physical, mental, and emotional health as best they can. Um, once again, please feel free to contact me through the podcast or through my own website if you have any questions or comments or concerns about COVID. Um, also, on a to end it on a maybe a slightly happier slash positive note, I hope that you're going to enjoy these future episodes of the podcast. I hope to provide some entertaining, uh, amusing, inspiring content for you. And if you have any suggestions as to future topics that you'd like addressed on the podcast, please let me know. You can check out the website at funkydiabeticpodcast.com, and that's obviously funky with a PH. You can follow it on Facebook, Twitter, or Instagram, or you can reach me through katherineetassi.com, and that's quickly spelled K A T H E R I N E. I-T-A-C-Y dot com. Soon I'll uh, put the podcast on some uh, other platforms like Apple Podcasts and Google Play. But in the meantime, you can just check them out on the website. So till the next episode, stay safe, stay healthy, stay happy, stay well. All my best, Kate. Thanks for listening to the Funky Diabetic Podcast. Tune in to future episodes by logging on to funkydiabeticpodcast.com, and that's funky with a PH. On the website, you'll find links to follow the podcast on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter, and you can submit questions, comments, and suggestions to me for future topics. Soon, you'll be able to listen to, subscribe to, rate, and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts and Apple Play. Remember, none of the opinions expressed in the episode should be construed as medical or legal advice. 
please consult a medical professional before making any changes to your diet or diabetes health care regimen. Hope you'll all be well, stay safe, stay happy, and keep listening to the Funky Diabetic Podcast.